I'm Scott Purdy, and I'm going to be talking about anomaly detection. So you may have heard about uh, the hierarchical temporal memory theory, but how do you apply that theory to a valuable real-world problem? Well, anomaly detection is one of the most prom promising applications currently, so I'm really excited to talk about how we're doing that. So first, what is an anomaly? Well, it's something that deviates from what is standard, normal, or expected. And there's a couple different types. So static or spatial anomalies are those in which the value is unusual, independent of any temporal context in which it occurs. So here's an example where we've taken a set of values and plotted them up on a chart. And we've used a clustering technique to identify outliers. And this is one way that you can do spatial or static anomaly detection. There are also temporal anomalies. And those are anomalies in which the value is unusual given the current temporal context. So the sequence leading up to the value or the pattern in which it's occurring uh, is what makes it anomalous, even if the value itself is something that you see uh, frequently in this data stream. So in this example, there's some period at the end where the value goes substantially outside the normal range. But there's also this period earlier on where the values are typical values for this data stream, but the temporal patterns in the data are unusual. All right, so there are some challenges with temporal anomalies. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple here. One is dealing with noise or unpredictable data. So uh, in this example, you can visually distinguish this period uh, that's anomalous. But uh, because there's all these spikes, uh, this is latency on the load balancer. It's very unpredictable. It's, it's difficult to know when those are going to occur. So you have to be able to detect uh, changes in, in the distributions of the data amidst all of this noise. Um, and then in addition to that, in real world data, uh, it's constantly changing. So you have to be able to update as the data changes. So in this example, there's a very clear anomaly that occurs. And then afterwards, there's new patterns and a new range in the data. And the system needs to update and understand that this is the new normal for the data um, so that you don't need a person to go in and manually update the models to handle the changes in the data. All right, so in the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk. I'm going to be going over how anomaly detection fits into HCM theory. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how exactly we do anomaly detection, and there's kind of two main parts to that. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we go about evaluating anomaly detection techniques. All right, so first, what does this have to do with the broader HCM theory? Well, uh, with the temporal memory, we have these sets of cells that are organized in columns, and between those cells are uh, connections that uh, allow the system to make predictions about what's going to happen next. And it turns out, in addition to prediction and classification problems, we can use these for anomaly detection. And I'll talk more about how we do that. Um, the one thing I want to stress is that this doesn't require any changes to the temporal memory algorithm. We don't need any new data structures or uh, we don't need to alter the algorithm. We can simply inspect the state of the temporal memory to compute this anomaly score. All right, so just really high level, uh, how do we go about doing this uh, before we get into the details? So here's a diagram where we have data coming in on the left. And the first step is to convert it into sparse distributed representations. So we have a set of encoders that understand how to do that. Uh, sparse distributed representations are these ones and zeros that are what the algorithms understand. So we can feed those then into the HTM learning algorithms, which learn the spatial and temporal patterns in the data. And internally, they're constantly making predictions about what's going to happen next. So we can take those predictions, and we can compute a raw anomaly score from them. And then we can do an additional step to compute this anomaly likelihood value. So I'm going to go into details for how we do these steps. And you don't have to understand the exact math behind, we, behind how we do this. If you're using NuPic or Grok, uh, we, it's already implemented in, in NuPic and Grok. Um, but I'll go through it to give you a sense for what we're doing. So first is computing the raw anomaly score from the temporal memory. So the temporal memory is learning the spatial and temporal patterns in the data. And we can look at the active and predicted cells and compute the raw anomaly score as the fraction of the active columns that were not predicted. So this is a value between 0 and 1, where 0 means that the value was completely predicted. And 1 means that the value was completely, uh, completely unexpected. Um, and this is going to be high when the spatial or temporal patterns deviate from what's been learned in the past. So again, 
the raw anomaly score is a fraction of active columns that were not predicted. All right, so we'll go through an example of that. So here is a sensor reading from a large piece of machinery. This is a, a windmill, and this is recording the, the temperature. And uh, there's a period at the end here where the machine actually fails. And so it'd be nice to be able to detect this as anomalous, but it'd be really nice if we could detect an unusual temporal pattern earlier in the data that may allow us to uh, detect that something unusual, unusual is happening so we can do predictive ma uh, maintenance on the machine. So we took this data and we fed it through the HTM learning algorithms. And we computed a raw anomaly score at each point. And this is what that looked like. So you can see that we did detect an anomaly when the machine failed, but there's also, a turns out there is a temporal period earlier on that's exhibiting unusual patterns. And uh, the HTM learning algorithms were able to detect that. So in this case, uh, the raw anomaly score works really well for telling us when there's unexpected temporal or spatial patterns in the data. But there's also some cases where the raw anomaly score uh, isn't quite enough. And, and notably in cases where there's, the data is very unpredictable, it turns out that we don't necessarily just want to know when there's unusual spatial and temporal patterns, sometimes in unpredictable da data that happens regularly, so we want to normalize for the particular data stream. So I have another example here. And this is the raw anomaly scores that we've computed for a fairly unpredictable data stream. And you can visually see that there's a period that looks maybe a little more unusual. Uh, the raw anomaly scores go up higher than normal. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot of uh, high anomaly scores throughout this data stream. And so we thought a lot about how to handle that, uh, this situation. And what we came up with was a process for computing this anomaly likelihood. And the way that we do that is we take the raw anomaly scores and we look at a window of historical raw anomaly scores that we've computed. And from those, we, uh, we determine uh, the distribution of those by computing the mean and standard deviation. Those define a curve, as you can see here. And then when we get new raw anomaly scores, we can compare them to the historical distribution to see, if, uh, to see what likelihood they were from the same distribution, or in other words, how likely is it that this is normal behavior for this data stream. So what we're looking for is values that fall way out on the tail end of this curve. So if we zoom in here, I've colored it, uh, the red area would be raw anomaly scores that are very likely to be deviating from the normal behavior for this data stream. And the yellow would be you know, somewhat unusual, but we don't have as much confidence. And then green, which is the vast majority of the curve, are values that are typical for this data stream. All right, so let's go back to this example with the raw anomaly scores where we saw a lot of high raw anomaly scores. How would this work with this data stream? So imagine that we're on the right side of this red box and we want to determine the anomaly likelihood for values coming after it. So we take some historical window of raw anomaly scores uh, shown here as uh, in, in the red box and we compute the mean and standard deviation, which are these, and those define a curve that looks like this. So we can use this probability distribution curve determine for new values to the right of that red box, how likely is it that they were, uh, that that's normal behavior for this particular data stream. All right, so this is a screenshot from our mobile, uh, the mobile application for our product, Grok. And what this is showing in blue is the latencies in a load balancer. And this is a fairly unpredictable data stream. And in Grok, it's fed those through the HTM learning algorithms to compute the raw anomaly scores, which go up ver uh, fairly high on a regular basis it's because it's a somewhat unpredictable data stream. And then they've done this process for computing the anomaly likelihood, and that's shown in these colored bars. And so you can see that Grok was able to detect the anomalous period with very high confidence. You can see the three red bars where there's a higher density of, of latency spikes. Uh, and it didn't uh, flag earlier periods as anomalous, even though the data there is showing uh, raw anomaly scores that are fairly high. And the reason that it's not is because that is the normal behavior for this particular data stream. So this is how we're able to reduce the number of false positives that we get amidst very noisy data streams. All right, so what about very predictable data streams? Here's an example. This is, again, a screenshot from the mobile application for Grok. And there's a very regular, this is the network traffic, and there's two little spikes, it may be a little difficult to see, but there's two little spikes occurring at a very regular interval. And so what's happened is Grok 
has fed this through the HTM learning algorithms. Because this is so predictable, the raw element scores are going to be very low. And when we see a spike occurring a little bit earlier than usual, as is happening where it's detecting the anomaly there, the HTM learning algorithms are not expecting that spike. So there's going to be a high raw anomaly score. And because this was such a predictable data stream, the standard deviation that we compute is going to be small, which means that probability distribution function is going to be very narrow. So even just one high raw anomaly score is enough to move far enough down that curve to get to the red section and is, is uh, enough for Grok to say with very high confidence that this is unusual behavior for this data stream. So this basically shows that in addition to the raw anomaly score capturing the uh, basically telling us when there's unusual spatial or temporal patterns, we can also normalize those for the given data stream to handle both very noisy and very predictable uh, data streams. So here's another example that illustrates continuous learning. So in this example, you can see there's a sudden change in the data. Grok detects that as anomalous. And then afterwards, the values settle in at a new range. And Grok very quickly learns these new patterns in this new range, understands that this is the new normal for the data, and stops calling it anomalous. This is called continuous learning, and this is really important for running these models on real-world data where the data can be changing all the time and we can't expect a human to go in and update the models. All right, one more example. Uh, this is a case uh, for one of the servers that we were running. Where we were monitoring three different server metrics. As you can see in the left image, uh, that's the instance view, so in the gray area it's showing the three uh, metrics being monitored, and you can see that there's anomalies being detected in two of those, which are the CPU utilization and the, uh, the disk write bytes. And so when we went to investigate this, we looked at those metrics, and you can see the two images on the right show the middle one is the CPU utilization, and we looked at that. And the values themselves don't really, it's difficult to tell why it's saying there's an anomaly there. So then we went and looked at the disk write bytes, which is the image on the right. And again, the values that are being fed into Grok are in blue. And we looked at that, and again, it wasn't obvious why it was detecting an anomaly there. But the way that we do this anomaly likelihood process, uh, these two metrics are being fed into completely separate models. So the CPU utilization model doesn't see the disk write bytes values and vice versa. So to see anomalies being detected at the exact same point in time is really unusual. Um, and so we went to investigate this, and this is a continuous integration server. So there's a process, an automated process, for kicking off these build pipelines on these servers. And those pipelines run a series of jobs. So when we asked around the office to see what was going on here, we found out that one of our engineers was trying to debug something. And they had, they had connected to this server, and they had manually kicked off one of the jobs. It was a normal job that runs on this server, but it was being run outside the context of the pipeline. And Grok was able to detect with very high confidence in two separate server metrics that there was unusual behavior going on on the server. So this is really quite remarkable, uh, that the system's able to detect unusual behavior even when a human looking at the data can't, deter can't say with, with uh, a high degree of certainty that there's uh, something unusual happening. All right, so to recap this, there's a, this is a two-step process. The, the first main step in the process is computing this raw anomaly score, and we do that by inspecting the state of the temporal memory. That tells us when there's unusual spatial or temporal patterns in the data, and it's continuously updating as the patterns in the data change. Then to normalize for noise in the data, uh, we have this process for computing the anomaly likelihood. And that, makes, that gives us a metric that's relative to the specific data stream. And it allows us to, uh, to label anomalies based on probabilities. So that's essentially how we do anomaly detection with HTM. And we recognize that there's a number of other ways that you can do anomaly detection on streaming data. I'm not going to go into all these details right now, but we have a white paper, The Science of Anomaly Detection, on our website. It goes into more details on a lot of things that were covered in this talk, but specifically in a lot more detail on how other techniques compare to using HTMs for anomaly detection. All right, so the final thing is how do we evaluate anomaly detection techniques? So 
the nature of streaming real world data is that it, you know, it's changing all the time. So you can't have training and test sets. Uh, you need the models to update in real time. You can't tune the parameters for each specific data stream in the benchmark because in real world, real world situations, you can't expect a human to go in and do that. And in addition to artificial data streams, uh, you need real data streams for, uh, from like sensors and things in, in, from the real world to really capture the types of patterns that you see in the, the changing uh, nature of the data. And we didn't really find any benchmarks that had these properties. And so if you know of any, definitely let us know. Um, but this really uh, was something that we wanted for our own purposes and for improving our algorithms. And so we put together a benchmark that we're calling the Numenta Anomaly Benchmark. This is a work in, pro uh, in progress. It contains high velocity streaming data. We currently have about 21 real data samples and 11 artificial. It's all hand labeled and we require that multiple labelers agree uh, on the labels in the, in the benchmark. And it's all open source and configurable. It currently runs the HTM learning algorithms that I just described as well as algorithms from Etsy's Skyline project. And you can find all the code for it at github.com slash numenta slash NAB. We're really looking for other people that want to participate in this, whether it's contributing data sets or running it on other, other algorithms. So uh, definitely get in touch if you're interested in that. And that's it. So again, there's the white paper called The Science of Anomaly Detection that goes into more details on a lot of things that we discussed. And you can find that easiest way is go to numenta.com slash Poundsign Technology. And feel free to reach out to me by email. And again, the Numenta Anomaly Benchmark is at github.com slash numenta slash NAB. That's it.